you, I would like to uh, um, introduce briefly our panelists. Uh, I'll start with uh, Philip Tegner, uh, who's joining us live from Shanghai in China. So thank you so much, Philip, for um, making this day a very early day for you. Uh, Philip is a seasoned automotive executive uh, living in China for many, many years and uh, who's held regional purchasing and P&L um, leadership positions with uh, Ferro Mogul, Hela, just to name a couple. Um, and he is today the chairman of the AASA, that's the Aftermarket Automotive Supplier Association for China. Uh, he's also a senior advisor for the um, automobility. Uh, he will share his uh, direct testimony of how work has already resumed in China uh, since uh, um, that country does have a few weeks, uh, uh, is a few weeks ahead of us. Um, the next panelist uh, locally is uh, uh, Gina Aglaya. Um, she's a very seasoned uh, uh, EHS expert, that's uh, Environment, Health and Safety. Uh, she gained her experience through um, 18 years of automotive logistics um, and a glass manufacturing background in various countries in Europe, Mexico, and the US. And currently, she's leading the EHS function for Plastic Omnium in the, Amer in the Americas, um, so guiding the return to work in 11 plants at the moment. Uh, very, very tough. Um, she is uh, planning to share today, though, uh, how Plastic Omnium is mitigating the risks and uh, striving to uh, protect its employees as manufacturing restarts. Um, the next panelist, a little bit uh, on a different, uh, um, different gear, is uh, Kathy Myers. Um, Kathy is a professional of the business travel. Um, she's held positions in Air France and KLM Alitalia. Um, she currently serves as uh, vice president at uh, Conlin Travel one of the largest travel management companies in the Midwest. So she'll be sharing with us the perspective of the travel industry. Um, and I think that we will all find that interesting as uh, um, probably traveling took 25, 50% even more of our time uh, before the lockdown. Um, finally, uh, Drew Coleman, uh, uh, currently with the MEDC, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, um, he is working uh, at developing attraction strategies uh, for investments in Michigan. So formerly Drew worked with the state of Michigan leading the state's effort with Japanese OEs and T1s. And uh, he will give us, uh, with his background and, uh, uh, and Michigan, uh, the uh, uh, a broader Michigan economic perspective. So um, short introduction, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen panelists, for helping us today in creating this uh, this sharing forum wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you again. Um, so without further transition, I'd like to hand it over uh, to Philippe and uh, uh, for him to um, share what, uh, what he's prepared for us. So Philippe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eric. So um, thanks, thanks for the introduction. So, um, okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me today. I'm honored to share with you some uh, some update on the uh, China market. So I will wait for the slide. So yeah, uh, so Cedric. Um, so next slide. So today my presentation will have uh, three parts. First, uh, how China went through the COVID-19 outbreak how we went back to work, and finally, how the automotive industry is recovering. Next. As you may know, um, the hard discussion uh, regarding the origin uh, of um, and the timing of the virus outbreak in China. So I, will, uh, I would like to remind some key dates. January 23rd, complete lockdown of Wuhan and Hubei region, which is the epicenter of the pandemia. January 25th, uh, uh, which is uh, the Chinese New Year, uh, um, when all other cities in China started to implement a level one emergency response, including lockdown. Business has progressively reopened on February 10th, uh, with the exception of uh, Wuhan and Hubei region. Plateau of the epidemia has been reached uh, second half of February, and on April 8th, uh, Wuhan was completely reopened. 
school uh, is a last milestone. Um, they will reopen on May 18. Uh, why so late? Because children are more resistant, but present, present higher risk of contamination. So local government was very, very uh, reluctant to, uh, to reopen the school. Next. Um, the lockdown um, uh, from, uh, from end of January uh, to uh, February 10. So the lockdown consisted outside of Roubaix of two weeks of quarantine, strict traffic control in and out each city. So basically, uh, we were not able to, uh, to leave the cities uh, where we were uh, staying. Uh, so for example, I was living in Shanghai. Uh, that was uh, very difficult. That was impossible to, uh, to go out of Shanghai if you were living in Shanghai, Beijing, same, and etc. So um, the government has had a clear guidance. So monetary mask and temperature check, access control at gate of each residence uh, with transportation reduced to the minimum. Uh, food were mainly delivered um, through online, uh, thanks to good last mile delivery. So people were ordering from uh, not Amazon, but the equivalent of Amazon in China, like uh, like you know Alibaba, like uh, Jindong. So um, so people were using a lot uh, uh, online uh, online delivery. Uh, people people were allowed to go out, so we were not blocked uh, at home. Uh, we, we had the authorization to uh, opportunity to go out, but vast majority of people preferred to stay at home and follow the safe recommendation. Uh, for Roubaix region, obviously the epicenter of the epidemia, uh, Roubaix region and Wuhan, the lockdown was complete. Um, so it was much more drastic than in other city with no possibility to go out of the compound or village. Next. So as mentioned, um, the, reop the reopening happened progressively from uh, February 10 outside of Roubaix uh, with a clear uh, guidance from local government when they start to reopen. Um, definitely mandatory mask, so everybody was wearing mask. Um, temperature check at every building when you go out, when you go in. Um, free test widely available, so the test uh, definitely were uh, were free, okay, so uh, very heavy uh, uh, testing, uh, social distancing, and something new uh, the implementation of an APP uh, to monitor the movement uh, for the last 15 days. Uh, so, for example, if you have been in touch with someone who has been declared sick, um, you had a QR code that, um, uh, so your QR code, well, the health QR code, uh, turn uh, from green to yellow or to red based on the risk. And then you are invited to, uh, to stay at home for quarantine from one week uh, if you are yellow and two weeks if you are identified red based on uh, basically um, the people infected that you potentially uh, were in touch, for example, in the same uh, subway or basically uh, in the street. So um, this APP, um, which is also used to be honest by Singapore, or similar are not the same, but other countries in Asia, uh, is um, is very important, uh, especially to handle the, the asymptotic case, asymptomatic case, which is now the biggest challenge, um, with obviously um, the second challenge, which is uh, an imported case, uh, with Chinese citizens uh, flying back to China from country uh, with um, uh, infection, like for example Russia. So um, uh, the utilization of this APP uh, again uh, quite uh, important and. Um, Whatever you enter into a building, you need to scan this APP. And as mentioned, it gives you information about the status. And so when the kids uh, go back to school, they will also have to scan uh, basically the APP to be allowed to go to, uh, to the school. Okay. Outside of Roubaix, uh, so as I mentioned before, business has restarted on February 10, um, but definitely a progressive restarting. Okay. Uh, the first two weeks uh, from February 10, uh, White collar, you know, the employee, office employee, uh, were invited to work from home. So um, they were not forced to go back to office. Um, then after, after two weeks, the third week, um, uh, the employee uh, had the, uh, were invited to uh, alternatively work from home three days and uh, work at the office two days. The purpose was again to uh, decrease the risk and, um, and to get less people at the office, uh, less contact. At the beginning of March, after three weeks, everybody was back to office. Um, for blue collar, uh, for uh, operators and uh, plant, most of the plant reopened at the beginning of February. But obviously, uh, we had a ramp up, a progressive ramp up, 
due to too many issues. A uh, lot of operators were coming from other regions and not necessarily uh, allowed to travel back because still some restriction from region to region. Um, so still some travel restriction. And also um, the plant manager had concerns that if they reopen and one single contamination happen, uh, the plant will be closed uh, by local government with no clear information when we reopen. So a lot of plant managers decided not to reopen exactly in February 10, but some decided to reopen two weeks later to avoid basically to get the plant closed if potentially one case happened. Next. So uh, at February 19, uh, the work resumption, um, work resumption rate was 60%. At end of March, it was close to 97%. Employee uh, returning rate was lower at end of March due to some operators staying in hometown uh, or replace. Uh, uh, as too late to uh, go back to work. Next. Um, so for factory, back to work has been a new experience with several challenges. Uh, protect employee wellness as a priority, obviously. Uh, restart the supply chain, which was a challenge. And obviously, another one, manage lower demand from export, but also from local markets. It will be uh, obviously uh, long to cover all, so I will focus on what factory have implemented uh, to reopen while in the meantime protect the wellness of employees. So local government have not provided a strict guideline regarding how to reopen factories. So it depends a lot on each factories and uh, definitely each company have different practice. So I will share with you some, um, some best practice, uh, best practice. So the first one is to set up a clear pandemic response team with a site manager and five pillars. Uh, the first pillar is employee access control lead, which controls the access uh, to the plant with a single entry point. So only one gate to, uh, to have better control and proper check and social distancing. Vi virus prevention and protocol leads to develop the protocol to ensure employee wellness, but also to manage regular audit. Um, sanit sanitization and disinfection lead responsible to manage the periodic disinfection of the different areas, which is obviously extended compared to normal. Communication and training lead responsible to inform and train the employee. And finally, PPE lead responsible to secure the supply of uh, relevant material. Um, next. The entrance uh, and rated check area are obviously very important with significant adjustment. Uh, one single entrance, I repeat, uh, one single entrance to the plant, uh, space to check temperature and scan uh, the QR code I was mentioning. Keep social distancing of uh, 1.5 meter um, with designated space for queuing. Avoid a uh, crossing of two shifts. So need to adjust the time when the shift go in and shift go out to avoid the rush hour and a lot of people in the same location. And mask area to collect mask every day for the employee, but also to collect the waste and the old mask. Next. General rules remain keep 1.5 meter social distance. Uh, mask is mandatory in workshop as well as safety glass and also sanitizer widely available. In meantime, stop utilization of air conditioning when meeting in closed area because it's airborne virus. So for example, in China now, you don't, we don't use air conditioning since almost um, three, uh, three months. Inform employee on symptoms and require employee to self-check. And obviously, if they identify some uh, symptoms, quick escalation to supervisor with, um, with containment location to, uh, to, to check, obviously, to double check. Meetings are kept to the minimum, so we avoid meeting face-to-face -face, uh, with lower capacity by room. So we fix uh, a capacity, obviously, uh, with uh, one empty space every two seats. Canteen requires specific organization with a space between employees, frequent uh, sanitization, and schedule to avoid rush. We avoid that a uh, lot of people in the same time in the canteen. So to do so, we also serve lunchbox avoid uh, and we recommend office white collar um, uh, white collar you know the uh, the office employee to eat uh, at their desk to free space at the canteen for the uh, for the operators eat their lunchbox at uh, at their desk next transportation is adapted to the situation with a limited business trip so uh, and also limited visitors company bus are organized to support one employee for two seats and with a frequent disinfection Local room utilization is uh, minimized with time for shift adapted to rush hour. So we avoid that, again, one shift, uh, you know, uh, uh, leave and one shift go in in same time. Um, so it requires some schedule adjustment. Shift change meeting are done, keeping social distancing. 
and uh, with proper sanitization to clean the button and equipment from one shift to the other. So all of, the, of those uh, you know, process and adjustment uh, may look, uh, may sound quite heavy, but it becomes for us you know, the new normal. And uh, to be honest, uh, until today, it seems to, uh, to work well because uh, um, we are still afraid or concerned about uh, a second wave of contamination in China, but at this stage, uh, the number looks promising. Okay, next. Um, so everybody is back to work, but the impact of COVID-19 in the economy is, uh, is deep. So the year-over-year -year growth, uh, GDP growth, has fallen 6.8% in Q1 in China due to the drastic containment plan, which is much bigger impact than 2008 crisis. So from one side, as I mentioned, a lot of people order online. So the online business has been strong, but not enough to compensate uh, the drop in offline. So the overall retail has dropped 20% in February. Next. The automotive industry, uh, which has been uh, um, in decline in China for the past two years, so 2018, we were a 2.8% 2, 2 drop, and uh, 2019, 8.2% drop. With COVID-19, we expect 2020 to see a drop of new car sales of 15%. Because in Q1 only, we have seen a drop of 45%. But, good news, next slide. We see a positive recovery. Um, if you see uh, on a weekly basis uh, since February, so um, which was obviously the, the biggest drop with 80% drop, we see on a weekly basis that is recovering. And um, we expect the sales go back to normal in Q3. Um, I get the sales from April and we see only a gap of 10% compared to last year. So we see a boost of people consuming uh, now especially for a uh, new car, because we also see that the school, the school are reopening. And to be frank, everybody is avoiding to use public transportation. So people <laughs> prefer to buy a car now, obviously, or speed up the purchase of car to, um, to avoid, basically, uh, to take, um, to take transportation for, for the risk. So we're confident on recovery, but as mentioned, you know, uh, we adapt to the new normal. So that's all from my side. I will be happy to, uh, to answer your question at the end. Um, so again, prepare your question, and uh, I'm uh, I'm very happy again to uh, to answer later on. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Kathy Myers. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, next, please. The U.S. Travel Association has established guidelines to be observed in all areas of travel. No surprise, they reflect the six basic areas that all businesses in the United States will observe to keep people safe, including modifying employee practices in public spaces, touchless solutions, enhanced sanitation processes, health screening measures for employees, and best practices for serving food and beverages. Next. When will business travel start to rebound? This is the big question in travel management circles. The answers are mostly guesswork, although there are a lot of surveys that are being done by different organizations, and I will share some of those results with you. Duty of care ranks as the top priority for all companies meaning companies will be very cautious that there is a safety and comfort level for their, for their employees to resume travel. A new normal will be driven by education for travelers to have confidence to travel. Travel policies are being rewritten by HR departments with input from the C-suite. C-suite will be more involved than ever now because of how critical it will be to get it right. Companies will meet be more dependent on the advice of their travel management companies and global companies that focus on safety and security for ongoing assistance in changes in worldwide regulations and procedures. Companies will develop communication plans and send out surveys to their employees to understand what employees will require to feel safe. Another big factor, especially for larger companies, is the management of unused airline tickets. Many companies have built up a stockpile of tickets for trips that have been canceled over the past few months. Identifying if they can be refunded or how they can be reused is a major task that will need to be addressed in order to mitigate the cost of ongoing travel. Next. 
all airlines, domestic and international, have greatly reduced capacity. There are grounded airplanes in major airports all over the world. Delta is currently operating 30% of their fleet system-wide. Other major airlines have similar statistics with the exception of Southwest and some of the other low-cost carriers that are still operating 60% of their flights, although these airlines have currently curtailed all international travel. We see more of their flights operating because they typically go to more um, non-business destinations. We will all be wearing masks on airplanes along with airline, airport, and onboard crews. Center seats are being blocked on many airlines. Delta Airlines announced just yesterday that their first class cabins will only be booked to 50% capacity and economy cabins to 60% capacity for traveler safety. The airlines all have complex algorithms to identify where supply and demand is. Additional flights will come back as needed. It is anticipated that US and domestic European flights uh, will be the first to pick up. Consolidation of airlines will accelerate. Some airlines that we know today will no longer exist in the coming years and many aircraft will be retired. Regulations and markets will be highly impacted. Initially, you'll see a lot of low fares, but as things evolve, airfares will be higher and heavily traveled routes will become the most expensive. There will be stricter visa screening and repatriation requirements. Various countries will have different laws for entry and departure, and they will be ever changing. It will be even more important than ever for travelers to know what the requirements are for international travel. Interestingly, air quality can be contained best in airplanes as opposed to in airports. We can expect all kinds of touchless devices and ongoing sanitizing. In Europe and other locations where high-speed trains exist, they will be the winner as we emerge from this period. People feel safer in trains and social distancing is easier to maintain in a train atmosphere. Next, please. Hotel availability around the world is currently quite inconsistent across various properties and chains. Some hotels are closed and some will sadly never reopen. Next. Cleanliness and safety standards will be paramount. Hotels are implementing string, stringent sanitizing and devising more processes for touchless door entry. No touch form of payment, self-service, no buffets, and on and on to avoid people getting too close together and touching things. You will see a limited number of people permitted in elevators and staying on floors of hotels. For those companies that have negotiated hotel rates at various hotel properties, static rates will no longer be competitive and travel managers and travel companies will be able to renegotiate rates at lower levels until occupancy rates increase. Large meetings, conferences, and conventions will see the slowest of the recovery as all large groups and contained areas will be the hardest to control the environment. Next. Car rental in the US will be strong, will be very strong initially, as it is viewed as a favorable alternative form of transportation for trips with less than four hours of drive time. Traveler environment can be easily sanitized and individuals can rent cars without fear of social distancing. In addition, car rental companies have been deemed as an essential service provider. Therefore, their service is readily available at all times. Car rental companies have increased sanitization of vehicles and are offering curbside pickup to minimize physical interaction and get you on your way quickly. It is believed that travelers will feel more comfortable in a rental car than in airplanes as travel commences. Share rides such as Uber and Lyft expect to be in decline for obvious reasons. Next. 
this chart is a moving timeline on what is predicted for travel resumption. It's believed that if the containment of the COVID-19 virus continues to improve, we will see a gradual reintroduction of increased travel. Charts such as this one are being updated constantly. In this model, some of the highlights are that the U.S.-Canadian border may reopen as early as May 18th. By mid-July, U.S. tour operators and cruise lines are cautiously optimistic to resume limited operations. We will see all kinds of variances on domestic and international airline resumption, but this will also be based on government regulations, especially for international travel. This chart does not show demand for business travel until the fourth quarter. I know this chart's kind of hard to read, but that's the indication here. Uh, although many companies are stating that they will resume traveling as soon as they are able. Others are focusing more on video conferencing and only traveling for e what's deemed as essential trips. Next. In this survey, we see results from polls taken in February compared to April. We see the share of those prepared to travel as soon as restrictions are lifted in decline from 22 to 14%. However, confidence is increasing to 60% of those surveyed saying they would be willing to travel after one or two months after restrictions are lifted. 14% say they would be willing to travel within six months and 12% say they would prefer to wait 12 months or longer before traveling. In general, we're uh, anticipating uh, business travel to be down uh, a minimum of 50% until the uh, third and the fourth quarter and resuming in 2021, uh, still not at, at, at the types of level we were seeing prior to COVID-19, but uh, gradually increasing. Uh, next, please. The global COVID-19 crises is one of the greatest challenges that the travel industry has ever faced. No one knows exactly how it will play out. However, there are many industry leaders carefully evaluating and reviewing past history and new data as it presents itself to ensure a safe recovery. If you would like more detailed information, uh, please refer to the Conlon Blue Skies website as it's being updated constantly with new information. And there's a plethora of more details there that you might find interesting. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Hi, so this is my turn now. My name is Gina Gleyal. Um, I work for Plastic Omnium and I am the regional manager for environmental health and safety in the Americas region. So as you will see during this presentation, um, I will present a plan for a safe uh, startup for operations. And you will hear some of the things that were already presented um, at the beginning. You will see how things um, you know, have been implemented uh, for one specific company, which is Plastic Comium. So um, uh, next, please. So of course, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the plan. Plastic Onion has uh, defined for a safe startup globally. So Plastic Omnium um, has one objective, which is protect our employees uh, from contamination. Uh, we have defined key sanitary measures to help work in safe conditions. So we have um, increased uh, cleaning and disinfection uh, we are ensuring all personal protective equipment is on site before we start our operations, which is masks, hand sanitizers, and uh, safety glasses, and other things. We are ensuring all sanitary measures are respected and implemented by having uh, audits uh, in our plants. And we want to avoid cross-contamination by reviewing flow of people and uh, material in our plants. Uh, we, so as I just said, uh, this plan is to be implemented in all our, of our production facilities and we are including all tech centers and offices globally. 
Um, next, please. So we have, um, in, in order to implement this, Plastic Commune has defined three pillars and 15 environmental health and safety restart fundamentals. So as you can see, the three pillars are people, process and facility, and flows and material. And our fundamentals are linked to one of them. So for our people, uh, we want to make sure we share and apply essential hygiene rules, like reducing physical contacts, screening and individual protection, and training and information for our employees, customers, and suppliers. For our process and facility, uh, the objective is to avoid cross-contamination in our meeting rooms, workstations, canteen, shop floor, and that's where we need and where we are defining uh, cleaning and sanitary standards. The third pillar, which is flow and materials, um, we need to prevent virus from entering our facilities. So we have uh, to review employee flow, within the plant, in transportation and car sharing when possible. We also uh, review the flow in supply chain areas with inbound and outbound logistics. And one of the, the last, but the not, least, not the least, is uh, we need to make sure all these fundamentals are implemented. So we need to perform daily auditing processes. So, um, this is the plan for the company, and normally we have 61 slides uh, to review each of them. We don't have time today, so I chose four fundamentals where I can provide um, some details and share them with you. So next, please. So the fundamental number two is uh, screening and individual protection. Um, this is a very important fundamental to implement in, in, in companies because uh, for Plastic Omnium, it's implemented in two stages. We have at home and at work. So at home, we are requesting our employees to self-monitor, um, to, to, sorry, to apply self-monitoring self policy for all of our employees by checking their own temperature before they go to work, when they feel you know, sick or tired, we are requesting that. And if they do have temperature, we request to contact HR in case of high temperature and to define the next steps. And next steps are defined in, in like a decision matrix uh, to know what to do. Uh, we have uh, at work is by checking uh, the temperature of every person that is entering the plant. We have one entrance or two entrances defined, um, depending on, on the size of the, of, the, of the facilities. And we are also requesting customers and suppliers uh, to self-monitor and to, uh, when arriving to our facilities, to have the temperature checked. They also use self-questioners um, to respond. And we have the PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, to be mandatory, which is mandatory in our um, for plastic omnium is a surgical mask for all employees and people entering any of our facilities. Uh, they need to to use a surgical mask, as I said. They they are defined in the quality and and performance. Any other alternative mask is to be evaluated case by case by our uh, central team and has to be validated before we can use them. Uh, we also have uh, safety glasses uh, when anybody's going to the shop floor and safety glasses are also to be used in other areas, but it's not mandatory. So next please. So this is the fundamental number four, which is avoid cross-contamination in mirroring rooms. And we do have an action plan for that part. Uh, we need to keep distance and we want to, uh, we are applying the one chair free policy. We are limiting face-to-face -face meetings as much as we can. Um, visual standards have to be displayed and respected in each meeting room. It is forbidden to leave any object, so we have to leave everything very clean. There are um, cleaning supplies in each of our uh, 
conference rooms to make sure we are cleaning before and after every meeting. We want to have a policy to air the room before every 15 minutes before meeting. So in one way to implement this, it's that we reduce the meetings to 45 minutes. So that way um, we ensure that we can have at least 15 minutes between meetings to, to, to change the, you know, the air in, in those areas. Um, air conditioning is to be shut down whenever it's possible. Um, we need to do that or one of, op one of the options we found is to uh, review the maintenance programs for each of the different um, air conditioning we have in the plants. So we need to have a filter change more often or increase the, the, the filtering capacity and, and many other things that we were able to, to do to reduce um, the risk of contamination. So other thing that is very important is we're also encouraging home office wherever it's possible. We are also starting in by percentages. We're trying to keep people at home uh, to come back. It, you know, we are defining essential workers and, and people that can stay home. So things are going to be changing depending on how things advance. If we see things are going well, when in two weeks we're going to have more people. So everything is being defined by HR and our uh, management teams. Next, please. The fundamental number 11 is employee flow. So separating of flows through physical barriers or marking when we can. And this is more focused in areas where we have increased passage like employees entrance, the lobbies, uh, driver's reception and collective areas like uh, coffee machine and the, our kitchens, right? So we also are avoiding a uh, shift crossing. So one way to do this, we are, we are doing and implementing staggered shifts wherever we can. So this means people are leaving the shift at 5 a.m. and next shift is arriving at 6 a.m. So we can ensure a proper uh, change of shift and some cleaning uh, duties in between. So we are, we are also requesting to have all doors and gates in open position to help ventilation. And this is of course assessed location by location and to make sure we are uh, keeping our assets safe and wherever it's possible. So we also request to have the turnstiles to be avoided. And most of the plants were able to uh, condemn the turnstiles and make uh, temporary doors where people can get in and avoid touching the, the metal, you know, and, and avoid that cross-contamination. Next, please. And this is our last uh, very important fundamental, which is daily up, up, up auditing process. Uh, this is very important, as I said, because we need to ensure all 15 fundamentals are implemented and respected by all employees. Uh, this is a process to, to install a, at every plant with a pluridisciplinary team to make sure um, all the 15 fundamentals have, are followed. And we can also know when one of them is not working well to understand the whys and also to implement an action plan to improve it and make sure our employees are keeping all of the the safe measures we designed for them. So um, next. So in conclusion, I can say um, that uh, implementing these 15 fundamentals is our top priority to ensure our employees are safe to go back to, the, to, to work. Um, each plant and facility has an harmonized safe startup planning. This is helping us to measure readiness for each site and compare them and understand what's, you know, how we can help them to improve. And uh, we are including also the engineering and tech centers and the offices in this readiness plan. And it's being monitored by the executive, our executive, executive committee. Uh, we are aiming to have one safe startup of production. This is very important because we want to start in a proper way to protect our people, our customers, and avoid any production uh, disruption due to any contamination in one of our locations.
So, um, and, and I want to tell you, this is what my, my conclusion to thank you for this, um, for your attention. And you can find the whole presentation uh, with the 15 fundamentals. Uh, it's public in our Plastic Commune website. So um, please feel free to visit the website and, and download the, the presentation for your, for your needs. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Drew Coleman. I'm the director of U.S. and Board Direct Investment at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. First, I want to thank Cedric for the invitation to participate in this event. The partnership between the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and the FACC is very important. Uh, we appreciate the mutual beneficial relationship. Also joining us today on the call is Laco Tomek Lobos, uh, who many of you have worked with uh, during his time representing Michigan and Europe. Uh, Blacko and I uh, stand ready to assist you and your businesses, partners, suppliers, and others uh, that may need assistance throughout this time. Blacko can follow up directly with you on all the information I shared today. So on the next slide, I'll introduce the MEDC. Uh, the, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, or the MEDC, is the state of Michigan's marketing arm to, to promote economic development. Uh, we, offer, we operate through many segments, including our beloved Pure Michigan campaign. MDC's vision is to make Michigan's economy the nation's fastest growing, most equitable, and most resilient by attaining the largest net gain of talent in the Midwest. Much of MBDC's success is creating economic opportunities is the result of impactful relationships with local economic development organizations, industry, academia, and federal, state, and local governments to foster economic development opportunities. As well, partnerships with the FACC and other global groups are key to achieving mutual and beneficial success. By maintaining a collaborative relationship with these partners, MDC is able to carry out its mission of achieving long-term economic, economic opportunities for Michigan families in all corners of the state. Today, as we all adjust to current situation, uh, these partnerships are especially important to our work, and we thank you for your continued collaboration. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Around the globe, Michigan is known for what it can make uh, as home to skilled workforce and imperiled work ethic. During the COVID-19 outbreak, that legacy of resilience, innovation, and Midwestern ingenuity is on display for the world to see once again as businesses and workers step up to help combat the spread of this virus by, by creating an arsenal of innovation. Uh, once the outbreak of COVID-19 first hit Michigan in early March, Governor Whitmer and her administration moved swiftly, taking decisive and necessary measures to respond to the public health emergency that quickly took hold in Michigan. Although Michigan is the 10th largest state in the nation by population size, uh, we were at one point uh, ranked third in the nation for the number of deaths from COVID-19, forcing us to take quick actions in response to the rapid response and the spread of the virus. Uh, due to the necessary restrictions placed on many businesses as Michigan residents began staying home over the past two months in an effort to slow the spread of the virus, uh, many small businesses, automakers, supply chain manufacturers, and even distilleries are now retooling and pivoting their operations to do what they can to support our healthcare workers on the front lines of fighting this virus, while also continuing to pay their employees. Between our state's traditional manufacturing expertise and our core world-class medical device companies, ranked in the top 10 nationally, Michigan is well suited to be the epicenter of the arsenal of innovation to support responsive efforts during this COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about uh, some of the activities that we've taken in that response. So during the outbreak, uh, the state's Pure Michigan Business Connect matchmaking program has launched a free online procurement and donation platform to assist suppliers of critical health and human services across a broad range of categories, including local municipalities and accessing supplies and products as they respond to the COVID-19 outbreak. The platform makes virtual introductions between businesses within the state that are capable of providing or donating supplies, including food, medical devices, paper products, cleaning equipment, and more. It also helps us identify any manufacturers with the capacity uh, required to produce needed personal protection equipment for our healthcare workers on the front lines. Utilizing this PMBC platform, uh, we've connected, as an example, Barber Packaging, a Bangor, Michigan-based industry leader in designing and manufacturing packaging systems uh, to the state's procurement process. As a direct result of this connection, uh, Barber Packaging is now supporting the need for PPE through um, throughout Michigan by filling orders for more than 500,000 face shields. This partnership helps ensure frontline medical workers are properly protected and mitigates the spread of COVID-19. Service providers seeking access to supplies and suppliers who have items to support COVID-19 through the through procurement or donations can learn more by visiting michiganbusiness.org slash COVID-19. 
During the week of April 20th, the MEDC also announced grantees for the new uh, Pure Michigan Business Connect COVID-19 Emergency Access and Retooling Grant Program. Through this program, we dedicated $1 million to provide grants to support Michigan businesses with eligible expenses, looking to immediately retool and manufacture critical health and human service supplies. Uh, through these grants, we're, we are helping businesses that just a few months ago were making tents, engines, and hydraulic filter cartridges, pivot to developing drive-through tents for COVID-19 screening, respirators, and surgical masks. And this is just one of, a, of, of, of several examples within the state. As small and mid-sized businesses across Michigan are negatively impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak, existing programs through MDC's Capital Access Program, open access to private lender financing, provide small businesses in Michigan access to capital that might not otherwise be available. Any business that's been affected by COVID-19 is eligible to receive support through the collateral support or loan participation programs. The collateral support program helps to enable borrowers to acquire the necessary financing that may be otherwise unavailable due to collateral shortfall. Again, additional information for these programs, the requirements, as well as applications can be found on michiganbusiness.org slash COVID-19. There are many lenders across Michigan that already participate in the MDC Capital Access Program. So please speak, please speak to your lender about whether this is an option that might be beneficial for you. And I think most importantly, as we speak on the next slide, is really understanding how uh, to re-engage Michigan, Michigan's economy. And the governor just came out today with a number of new updates that I'll be sure to, to share with Cedric um, on the, the My Safe Start plan that has been additional information provided today, but I'll go through some prepared remarks uh, that also hit on, on those topics. Uh, so the state's been working very closely with medical experts, business leaders, local government, labor, economists, to develop a data-driven approach to re-engaging its economy when it's safe and appropriate to do so. Through Governor Whitmer's My Safe Start plan, Michigan has begun to re-engage certain sectors of our economy in phases, beginning with those that pose the least amount of threat. Uh, once allowed to reopen, businesses will need to protect their employees by carefully monitoring them for symptoms, instituting an array of social distancing techniques, strengthening sanitation and hygiene, and providing recommended protective equipment like masks and face shields. Uh, already, uh, the governor has begun to implement her plan as the construction industry was able to reopen today, and with manufacturing businesses now being allowed to reopen starting May 11. Meanwhile, other businesses have also been allowed to re-engage with our economy already, including landscaping, uh, businesses and golf courses. As the state continues phasing in certain sectors of our economy, Governor Whitmer is focusing on progress in four key areas which are in front of you here. Uh, these factors include sustained reduction in infection rates, enhanced ability to test and trace, sufficient healthcare capacity uh, to handle a resurgence, uh, and best practices in the workplace. Governor Whitmer has also introduced or announced her partnership with governors from Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky with plans to work in close coordination to reopen the Midwest region in a way that protects families from the spread of COVID-19 and helps businesses get back on their feet. We, we understand that many businesses are facing uncertainty right now, and our economy is going to look very different uh, than we're used to during the next couple of months. But MNDC is committed to leveraging every resource for relief and recovery efforts uh, once our economy begins to reopen once more. Um, so this last slide here will provide you the direct links that uh, provide additional information on michiganbusiness.org slash COVID-19. Uh, this page is updated with additional federal and state resources uh, as those become available for small business and also highlights existing MNC programs uh, that small businesses and others may uh, want to be aware of. While there, you can also sign up for regular COVID-19 e-blasts and also at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, there's a number of resources for employers and workers, including information for um, unemployment insurance to sign up for regular COVID-19 updates and to stay informed on the governor's latest efforts to mitigate the impact the virus uh, is having on Michigan residents and economy. Again, thank you all for allowing us this opportunity to present to you. Um, obviously, this is a very impactful and evolving situation, but I think these partnerships are key to our continued uh, recovery and a mutual recovery um, for all of us. Thank you. Hello, this is Lisa, Executive Director of the French American Chamber of Commerce. So, um, this is a Q&A session. It's starting right now. Uh, 
questions. All questions we received so far were for uh, Katie, who did a great job replying. So I would say there was no question that was left unreplied at the moment. So maybe we will give one minute or two uh, in case of you, you guys want to ask a um, question to any of our speakers. Yeah, so Eric is uh, asking uh, a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, it's, about, it's about the travel ban um, between Europe, Europe and US. Uh, of course, like in these uncertain times, there are decisions and things that work in a certain way. Uh, at the moment, I think, uh, Katie, uh, I'm not sure you are unmuted. Let me check. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think you are unmuted. Uh, it's very hard to re reply uh, these questions right now, um, Eric, because you know it's decision based on governor's uh, choices. Uh, in uncertain times, again, we don't have this information. Uh, Katie, if you have more detail to provide, uh, I'm not sure you have, but. No, I really think that uh, the, the, everything is very fluid also. So I think we have to keep in mind that uh, things are, are constantly changing, but uh, there are, um, uh, we do have some guidelines posted on the website that I mentioned to you that shows what the restrictions are in and out of uh, all major countries. So I would just say that um, as far as foreigners coming into the U.S. or particularly into Michigan, you know, I think the governor's been quite conservative. I think we can expect her to continue to be conservative until we have uh, gotten to a point where we've met the guidelines of the CDC. Uh, but I think we just need to constantly monitor to see to see what the changes are. Thank you, Katie. So Eric has a question for Philip. Uh, Philip, I don't know if you um, if you can see the question in the chat box. Uh, Philip, Philip, Philip. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. You are unmuted. All Chinese companies are not world class, and the supply chain in automotive and aftermarket has some fairly well, not very organized company. Have you heard? of or experience some companies closed by government. How do, how do tier one and OE react to that? Uh, no, so uh, definitely uh, some company, you know, um, as Eric mentioned, not so well organized. Uh, uh, so uh, government try to, <laughs> you know, is always a balance between uh, creating unemployment by closing some operation when already the uh, economic environment is challenging. Uh, and in the same time, try to uh, rationalize a supplier base by uh, keeping the best. So for government, this is a challenge, you know. Um, so they, um, they definitely uh, implement some environment requirement, which has forced some company to close. But in the current environment, um, uh, some companies are facing challenge. You know, there is a peak of demand for export uh, from China to the world, because uh, um, you know that uh, a lot of plants are closed in India and Mexico. But we foresee that uh, uh, after uh, Mexico, India, US is reopening, uh, some and the, and the and the tariff still there. Uh, we believe that the export in China will decrease, so some companies, especially the less organized, will close. Uh, but it's not going to be uh, pressure from government, local government, to close. It's basically because some will run out of business, and this will help the supplier base in uh, China to be uh, to keep the best. So it will be a way to rationalize it. But again, it's not the government that is going to push for closing, uh, closing uh, some uh, low level company because they have to face, you know, with the crisis, a uh, problem of unemployment. That, uh... Okay. Thanks for your reply. I hope it replies your question. Um, Eric, I, yes, you are unmuted. Do you uh, have no, I wanted to thank uh, Philippe for, the, okay. uh, for his answer here. So thanks again. Um, the, um, uh, the, what I understand from your comment is also that uh, you see uh, from the traditional um, global customers of the Chinese supply base uh, some 
um, some drive to reshore or to source out of China? Is that, uh, is that being emphasized uh, or um, uh, is that being uh, um, uh, accelerated by, by COVID or do uh, you see just the same trend at the same rhythm going on after the tariffs have been implemented? No, it was definitely accelerated. Uh, you know that uh, at the beginning of the crisis, we saw uh, phase one, which was uh, China uh, lockdown and the rest of the world was still open. So for uh, many importers from Europe and US, um, they have to face situation that especially for US, you had the tariff, 25% markup huh, uh, from last year, plus uh, Chinese supplier cannot deliver because uh, <laughs> they were closed. So that was definitely... Uh, additional, um, you know, uh, wake up call uh, to say, wow, we need to uh, less depend on China. And um, we already obviously uh, saw at this time that was even more pressure to uh, check alternative uh, source in Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and India particularly, um, and also reshoring uh, US and uh, Mexico. Uh, so we saw it, but also there is a paradox because as mentioned, when the crisis become global, uh, and China reopened. Now we see a big demand for, uh, in, in Chinese company. Um, but I believe this is a phase two. And after when situation go back to normal with more reopening, we will keep uh, this process of reshoring or more balanced supply chain. And as you mentioned, um, US company or European company look at, uh, uh, again, a more balanced supply chain with um, sourcing from other best cost country uh, outside of China. Yes. Great. Thank you, Philippe. All right. So I don't think we have further questions. Um, no. I okay, we can leave it there. We can leave it yeah. there. Uh, so I will, um, I will conclude if you but spare with me one second. Cedric, just yes. uh, you wanted to share a poll with uh, our guest. I was wondering. No, no, correct, correct. I'm going to conclude. One okay. Second, please. Okay, very good. So, uh, for some of you who don't know me, my name is Cedric Ballarin. I'm the president of the, the French American Chamber of Commerce in Michigan. I wanted to thank you, our panelists. Uh, this evening. So for one of them very early this morning, uh, Philippe joining us from, uh, from China. Uh, thank you for your unique perspective on the impact of COVID-19 on the new reality. And so we are all facing a challenge. Uh, the new life is going to be different than the one we are used to. And you each brought a unique perspective based on your experience, based on your function, based on the organization in which you're part, uh, to give us an overview of what that new reality could be. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for all attendees uh, who have been joining us tonight. Very much appreciated. And your support in that time is appreciated. I will conclude by uh, highlighting two things. Uh, first one, um, I would like to uh, invite all of you to join us for our next event at the FACC next Thursday, May 14. So completely different topic uh, because we are going to have a virtual wine tasting and an exploration <laughs> of uh, Loire Valley. So I invite you to join us for that event and register on our website, faccmi.org. And the second thing uh, I wanted to do before concluding is to uh, send you a poll. So you're going to come out to see coming up on your screen uh, a poll. I'm asking you for your help in answering the question, which is what best or what next event the FACC should focus its attention on. And you will see multiple choices and you can pick multiple answers about what uh, these uh, uh, this topics or events should be. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing all of you again soon. So you should see it coming on your, uh, on your screen and uh, please uh, do respond.
There we go. So the poll is, has ended. Uh, share results. So all of you still online, you can see uh, that basically specific automotive forecast is uh, the most interesting topic uh, alongside the uh, general economic forecast and uh, social virtual networking. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, interview with the leader. Okay, very good, very, very good. Okay, so thank you all. We'll stop there. Uh, I appreciate your support and we'll see you again each other soon. Thank you. Thank you.